to the March meeting. Um, tonight, I'm going to be covering the Artemis One mission, at least in terms of the launch readiness update. Um, I was hoping originally when he had booked, the, booked this meeting that we actually would have had been actually able to cover the launch, but I'll be talking about this later on as to where it's up to. We're getting very close to the launch, but now we're looking at um, some of the other events that have to take place. So we'll be covering that shortly, okay? Well, thanks very much for joining us tonight. And um, I've got about three videos in this talk as well. So we'll be seeing some presentations. Just to remind those people of why it's called Artemis. Artemis is actually the twin sister of Apollo and the god goddess in Greek mythology. So um, it, it's an indication that NASA is thinking about the renewal on um, uh, the, um, the actual space program um, from, from the Apollo days. So um, to note, um, that's what we'll be looking at uh, tonight. And I'm going to be sharing a, a brief video introduction in a second, but the the Artemis uh, One mission is basically due to the, the power of the SLS and the Orion space capsule. So just to give you a bit of an overview of the space capsule again, um, Orion's really the only spacecraft that's now been built for, for deep space. Um, unlike some of the other the um, craft that, say, for example, SpaceX is developing, um, Orion is actually developed for, for deep space and for long duration missions really in excess of six months. So um, that particular craft is capable of potentially going all the way out to Mars, the way that they'll be developing the craft in terms of its life support systems and stuff like that. And currently the SLS is the only rocket that we can actually use for um, um, this particular type of mission. Um, you'll see later on in, in the presentation what we're up to in terms of um, some of the, the current launch vehicle capabilities, but that's a um, thing to note. Um, in terms of currently how the, the technology stands. So Artemis 1 is the, the first launch of the SLS stack in the Block 1 configuration. And as you can see some of the stacking diagrams here we've got. With the space launch system lift capabilities, you'll, you'll notice that the um, we're currently it's still only on block one configuration. Block one B configuration is is an upgraded version of the um, the Artemis stack, and that won't be really available until the third mission, which will actually be the landing mission um, for Artemis Artemis three. But they use uh, in the current block one configuration, it, it's got a limitation on how many tons it can throw into. Um, to basically lunar orbit. So you'll see later on, um, some, so I'll, I'll give you some updates on where that's up to in terms of configurations tonight. And just a further update of some of the launch capabilities there, you'll see that um, as we're going from, from left to right, as, as things get bigger there, um, the Saturn V, the, the SLS Block 1 cap capability, it's a little bit smaller than the Saturn V in size, but um, can, can potentially get a fairly large payload to the moon, but not the same capabilities exactly of the Saturn V. And as, as you can see on the right-hand side, we've got the Starship Super Heavy, which is in fact um, something that we're still working on. Um, that um, hopefully we may even get to see a launch of that in the next couple of months. So I heard something the other day to indicate that um, it will be potentially even tested as, as early as April, but um, I believe that it's still requiring the FAA to clear um, Elon Musk's uh, capability of launching that a test, test of the, um, the Starship from, from Boca Chica down in Texas. But as you can see there with the, some of the vehicles, um, one of the vehicles um, next to the Yeni cell, which is actually a fairly new vehicle that actually has not been tested yet. Um, but um, it's something that the Russians have been developing for a while. So the vehicles that we've got there and the majority of them are currently have been used or will be used shortly, but there's a couple of them still there. This is a diagram indicating um, what the capabilities basically are of these vehicles in terms of capacity. So for, for basically it's got the Leo, then it's got the GTO and the, then the translunar in injection payloads that, that can go out 
you can see there's quite a quite a variation of these and the older vehicles and really the um uh the, the space shuttle was never really designed for um to send anything into um to um to planetary orbits although i think a couple of times it did launch something that potentially could go there but they were as you can see the payloads were quite quite small compared to what artemis is going to be able to send just to give you an overview of the space launch system block one which we've got there um, you'll notice some familiar components in it. It's got the RS-25 main engines from the shuttle. It actually will be using some of the original shuttle engines. They have, NASA, NASA has kept these engines from the space shuttle program and are actually refurbished them and upgraded them. Um, they'll basically be running at a higher, higher profile um, in terms of the actual um, thrust. I think that they're running around about between 110 to 120% of the original capacity that they're rated on but these these are only be used once unlike when in the case of the original engines that were developed for the space shuttle program they, they were reusable these ones will only be used once only now uh, for that basically the revised launch profile they've had to be upgrade the controller controllers in them to be able to handle the extra thrust and make some other modifications but they're not significant ones uh, the other thing to note is the solid rocket booster that's being used with it has got um, a similar capability to what was being used on the, um, uh, the, the space shuttle, but instead of having uh, four segments, it has five. There's also some changes to the, the internal um, cross section of it to change the burn profile. So it will be a slightly different um, timeline in terms of how long this thing burns for and also the um the, the the main core stage is basically going to be using uh liquid oxygen and liquid hydrogen something similar that was used on the space shuttle um the main engines lahore also has an upper stage and that's the where, one where you have the um orion capsule with uh attached to it and also um There'll be there'll also be some payloads coming in that um, in that launch vehicle. Um, sorry, the upper stage as well, with where the Orion capsule and the and the service module is attached to, as well. Just giving you an overview of the um, Orion um, capsule. It's called MCPV. I think it's the long word acronym. Um, it has a crew, crew capsule, a European service module, and a launch abort system. It's also got a spacecraft adapter as well, um, which is basically the thing I was describing earlier. As you can see, it's a, it's a rather unusual shape vehicle in, in some ways compared to the, uh, the Apollo command and service module, but you also see some similarities in a minute when I just show, show it to you, the comparison. So the European service module was made um, in basically by two major contractors in, in a fraud set up by the US European Space Agency. That was um, um, Alania Spas and um, Airbus. And as you can see, it's a fairly large module as well. And that has all the, um, basically the cry, sorry, the, the fuel components uh, unlike the Kavala command module and sorry, command service module, from the um, Apollo days, um, it, it's not using fuel cells, but it'll actually have um, solar panels to power the electricity for it. It will also have batteries, of course, to, to um, top up the electric electrical components in the um, Orion capsule. But it's got um, a, a fuel, fuel as well. Um, the, uh, so this particular module has been under development for a few years and they're also building, say, they're at the second module now stage. So it was one of the last components delivered for the um, SLS and it took a little while to integrate into the complete package. That was partly why some of the delays were taking place with the SLS um, uh, in general uh, from Artemis 1 because basically um, they were waiting for this, this particular module to be checked and checked out after it was built. You can see comparing it to the Orion capsule to the Apollo command module, um, 
it is a larger capacity, the Orion module is. So um, it's quite a, quite a, uh, it has enough room for, for four astronauts and um, it's quite a lot larger capacity wise. Um, and I believe that the, the other thing to note with the, the Orion capsule is it's quite different to the old um, command module and that it actually has what they call a glass cockpit similar to what they were using in this in the space shuttle in the in the later days but probably closer to what if from what you'd seen visually inside the um uh the spacex dragon dragon 2 capsule with the current mission though it won't really be using some of these directly because there'll be no crew there will actually be it will be set up in a similar way to the capsule but it doesn't have any it will not have any life support systems operating at all for the mission, uh, but it will have most of the technologies that the um, manned mission will have. But Orion, uh, sorry, the Orion capsule for Artemis One will be unmanned. As it's saying earlier, the prime contractor is Lockheed Martin, um, much larger volume, and it's got the glass compact flight deck. And as you can see, just looking at, even at the base there, it's um, probably about 20%, 30% larger. European service module, a bit more details on that. As I said, it's, it's got uh, long, longer duration missions. And in fact, uh, what they'll be doing for the first mission is flying it for around about um, I think this could go up to about 40 days, this particular mission will be, uh, depending on the, um, the orbits that the, when the launch occurs as to how long the mission duration will be for which I'll explain shortly. But normally the missions that they'll be planning for the Artemis series to the moon, um, the, the basic, basic uh, mission life will be for the first few missions about 30 days uh, for an Artemis mission. Where of that time, there will be at least um, two weeks spent on the moon. And these are the various um, spacecraft compared again. As you can see, we're looking at the Soyuz compared to the, the Shenzhou capsule that China's got. And um, you can see that the, um, the capacities in the Orion are quite, um, quite significant compared to the other capsules, which does make it a lot easier in terms of uh, habitation for, for a crew for a period of time. Now, if you were following the news the last couple of days, you'll note that um, a NASA has made an announcement that the the, the actual Artemis one has been stacked in the uh, vehicle assembly building and it will be rolling out this Thursday or Friday Australian time, I believe. Um, so they've basically said it will be rolling out on the 17th of March. That's going to be for the wet dress rehearsal. Um, so um, we're actually at a stage now where they're almost down to the final checklist that they'll be doing for the mission. And um, that's going to be something that's going to be taking place, I think, um, and we'll pad for about the next, once it gets to the, um, the launch pad for about, I think, 10 to 14 days, I think they'll be discussing exactly how long it's going to be out there for, for the tests that they'll be doing, but there will be a complete fueling test on it. So um, it currently will be going out there, not completely fueled, obviously, and then they'll be, they'll be fueling it. And, um, at that point, they'll be doing some a test countdown on it. They have already done a test count, countdown on it, um, at least test countdown for the mission earlier in January. But this one will be the formal dress rehearsal countdown on it. And um, yes, yeah, so that's originally that the plan would have been for um, no earlier than February. Now we've been delayed. So we're now looking at um, the launch window is 15 days each month. So what happens is they can launch it over a period of 15 days during the month, but, but that will also have an effect on what day during that launch window they launch the, it's launched as to how long the mission is going to be for. <clears throat> so it could be 
it could be ranging between either 28 or 42 days, and that depends really on the, the physics of the launch window itself as to when it goes out. Um, so we're looking at launch opportunities really between April and June that I've got down there. But I think at the moment, based on what it is expected to happen, I don't believe anything will happen until May. So um, despite the fact that there is a, an April launch, launch window in there, I think you'll find that um, it's not going to be launched in April and more likely I'll be expecting it to be going up in May. So um, hopefully in the next month, we'll certainly be showing you pictures of the, the rollout. And um, I've already got a video of the stacking, which I'll, I'll show you later on, probably at the end of the presentation. Um, so that will be something that we'll be um, basically covering as well then um, just to show you what um, what you'll be able to see there uh, in terms of the actual um, stacking and also a, um, another view of the, um, the launch, basically the mission profile. So uh, NASA is actually holding a press conference today. So um, as in tomorrow, I think that you'll hear more, a bit more about exactly what their, their plans are on that, where they'll be asking them probably specifically about the dates. Okay, so I'm just going to put this on quickly now. This is the problem. In the next eight minutes, you'll experience a 25 and a half day mission from rollout to recovery. The first integrated flight test of the Orion spacecraft and the Space Launch System rocket launching from the Kennedy Space Center is about to unfold. This is the first of many missions to come that will use the Deep Space Exploration System to prepare our team, our ship, and our astronauts for human operations in deep space. Rollout from the Vehicle Assembly Building signals that launch is near. Sitting atop the mobile launcher, the crawler transporter moves along the crawler way towards historic launch pad 39B <laughs> at the Kennedy Space Center at a top speed of one mile an hour. After traveling over four miles, the rocket and the spacecraft climb up a ramp and are positioned over a flame trench. Once in position, the mobile launcher is lowered onto support post and the crawler is rolled away to a safe distance. Final checks are performed at the pad, including crew cabin closeout via the access arm sitting over 300 feet above the surface of the launch pad. The launch date is set and the teams are prepared for the mission that is about to occur. At sunrise on launch day, engineers in the launch control center have already powered up the spacecraft and the rocket and loaded the core stage and upper stage with cryogenic fuel. As launch window open approaches, final checks are performed. And when all systems are go, terminal countdown is initiated. The big physics of launch are about to be put on full demonstration. Umbilical plates weighing hundreds of pounds await their cue to retract to clear the path of the rocket at liftoff. Some mounted on arms the size of tractor trailers. The mighty core stage engines are prepared for engine start as they are thermally conditioned for an onrush of cryogenic fuel in the heat of ignition. At T minus 15 seconds, sound suppression is activated, cascading water into the flame trench to dampen the acoustic shock. And as the core stage engines achieve full throttle, shock diamonds appear. At booster ignition, the flame trench is flooded with fire. At first motion, all umbilical arms are retracted and the rocket clears the tower in just seconds. At liftoff, the vehicle produces 8.8 .8 million pounds of thrust and lofts the vehicle weighing nearly 6 million pounds and standing 32 stories tall to orbit. Propelled by a pair of five segment boosters and four liquid engines, the rocket achieves maximum dynamic pressure only 90 seconds into the mission, the period of greatest atmospheric force on the structure of the rocket. Thousands will gather in Florida to watch our ship get smaller and smaller and leave the Space Coast behind. Approximately two minutes into the mission, the boosters will have consumed all of their solid propellant and are safely jettisoned. The rocket will continue on, guiding itself to orbit with magnificent precision. Just three minutes into the mission, the service module fairings are jettisoned to lighten the vehicle and expose Orion's solar arrays. Just 40 seconds later, the launch abort system is also jettisoned it is no longer needed. Orion could safely abort at any time. Once at the desired velocity target, the core stage engines are shut down and the core stage separates. The interim cryo propulsion stage with Orion will continue to orbit the Earth. Along the way, they will pass through the altitude of the International Space Station at 250 statute miles. During this first orbit, 
the solar arrays are deployed so that Orion no longer needs battery power. It can now produce its own power. Following solar array deployment, the arrays are positioned into a load bearing configuration to prepare for the perigee rays maneuver. The rays maneuver will ensure an earth orbit and use the thrust provided by the interim cryo propulsion stage. Once the perigee rays maneuver is complete, Orion systems are checked prior to committing to the translunar injection or TLI maneuver. The TLI maneuver must be successfully completed to depart Earth orbit. The TLI burn is approximately 20 minutes in duration and increases the spacecraft's velocity over 9,000 feet per second, a speed change faster than a high power rifle bullet travels. Following TLI, Orion is committed to a lunar trajectory just one and a half hours after launch. Once complete, the spacecraft adapter will remain with the interim prow propulsion stage and they will separate from Orion. As Orion departs low Earth orbit, it will fly through the orbital debris field encircling the Earth, past the global positioning navigation satellites, past the communication satellites in geostationary orbit, and through the Van Allen radiation belts on into the deep space radiation environment. Orion is now entering an outbound coast phase. The spacecraft is uniquely designed to navigate, communicate, and operate in this deep space environment. The outbound coast to the moon will take approximately four days. As Orion approaches the moon, the service module will be used to perform a critical lunar gravity assist maneuver, allowing the ship to enter a distant retrograde orbit about the moon. The moon will get larger and larger in the window, and at closest approach, Orion will be just 62 miles from the surface of the moon. As the spacecraft flies around the far side of the moon, we will lose all communication back on Earth, and for a period of time, Orion will be on its own. Mission Control will await acquisition of signal, and as we lock on, a new generation will see their first Earth rise. The spacecraft is now in the distant retrograde orbit, where its systems will be tested in the deep space environment for over a week. Along the way, our ship will travel farther from Earth than any human-capable spacecraft has ever gone. At the farthest point, Orion will be some 1,000 times farther from Earth than the International Space Station at over 270,000 miles away. Teams in Mission Control Houston and at Naval Base San Diego will prepare for Orion's return home, and the recovery ship will set sail for the recovery zone in the Pacific Ocean. Orion will exit the distant retrograde orbit with another Lunar Gravity Assist and Service Module engine firing. Along the way, the trajectory will be adjusted to target the Earth's thin atmosphere at over a quarter million miles away and ensure a precision landing in the Pacific Ocean following a direct entry. During the coast home, Orion will maintain the desired tail-to-sun attitude to optimize spacecraft cooling and maximize power production in the deep space environment. Another four days return coast home to Earth. As our home planet fills the windows of Orion, an important contribution from our European partners called the service module has done its job. The service module is jettisoned and separates. Following separation, the world's largest heat shield will be oriented into the direction of travel to prepare for entry interface at an altitude of 400,000 feet. At entry interface, Orion will hit the Earth's atmosphere traveling at a speed of 24,500 miles an hour and decelerated up to nine times the force of gravity. The heat shield will protect the spacecraft from temperatures half as hot as the surface of the sun, approaching 5,000 degrees Fahrenheit. Orion will continue to decelerate, pass through the sound barrier, and announce its arrival to the waiting recovery team with a sonic boom. Following peak heating, a protective thermal cover that sits over the parachutes will be jettisoned. This begins a series of parachute deployments. The drogue chute deployment series is designed to stabilize and slow the spacecraft and in a period of less than 20 minutes, Orion will slow from a speed of Mach 32 to zero at splashdown. The three main parachutes will deploy and slowly unfurl and suspend the 22,000 pound capsule and allow it to gently descend to the surface of the ocean. After 25 and a half days and a total distance traveled exceeding 1.3 million miles, a precision landing within eyesight of the recovery ship. Following splashdown, Orion will remain powered for a period of time as Navy divers approach in small boats from the waiting recovery ship. After a brief inspection for hazards, the divers will hook up tending lines and a tow line. 
The capsule will be then towed into the well deck of the recovery ship. And once the capsule clears the stern gate, the gate will be closed, the well deck will be drained, and we will bring our ship home. We invite you to follow along at www.nasa.gov slash exploration. Yeah, we'll note that presentation was given, indicated the, the time of the mission was around about 26 days. So as I was saying earlier, it depends very much on the position of where the moon is when they do the launch as to how long the, the profile is going to be. And that will have an impact and probably on the number of days it will take to get to the moon, plus also how, how large that retrograde orbit is going to be that they'll put the capsule in. But the reason for it going in such a long orbit is that it's going to get very close to the moon at one point, but they'll also then be um, taking it out a long way out uh, as probably as they would, as Mike Seraphim was saying in that presentation, further than any Apollo capsule's ever really been in terms of how far away any any craft has been in deep space. So it's going to go a fair way out, obviously, as part of this test. But for the manned mission, they don't intend to do a profile like that. And I'll show you in a few minutes. So, so I'm going to be giving you a bit of an update also on the other uh, missions as well. What have we got here? Yes, okay. So just to give you an update of where we're up to at the moment, um, that was the, the major checklist of integrated testing. Um, we're really going to be up to phase two, I believe three and four have just been finished now, uh, or maybe they're just doing three at the moment. So when I got this, this was actually released about a month ago by NASA and the third and fourth steps have just been finished on this checklist as well now since then. So the actual stage that we're going to be up to is the demonstration of tanking and detanking with cryogenic. And um, I think that the other, the pyrotechnics and the flight termination system, which is really the, um, uh, the, um, the, the escape, escape section, that's going to be the last test that will be done. I'm, I can't recall whether that's going to be done on the pad or we'll be doing that uh, before the actual launch. But the intention basically is with the rollout is that the, uh, I believe it, it will be rolled back into the VAB. I don't believe they're going to keep it out there um, uh, for the duration of the, the time between the, when they do the test and the, um, the launch. But this, this will all be revealed probably tonight in terms of what they're intending to do. But there's a chance that if there is any problems, they will take it, take it back in uh, rather than leave it out there for the actual launch itself. But as you can see, the earliest date that really the launch would be possible on is, is the 9th of April at this point now, and between the 9th and the 24th. And just to give you an overview again of what we were talking about there earlier at the, at the um, uh, yeah, as you can see, there's quite complex um, physics there in, in getting the capsule out, but the, the timelines are, uh, have been discussed earlier, but it was going to take in the order of about three or four days to get out to the moon once the launch occurs, and then it'll be going into a rather a large retrograde orbit where they'll be testing a lot of the uh, the renewing of the service module, I'm assuming, and probably they, I'm assuming they'll also have cameras on there as well to, to capture things too. But it's going to be on a uh, quite a quite a, a slow, um, long orbit there to test test the systems and also the uh, service module. Now, to give you a bit of an overview of what's also going to be on the, um, the first mission, they actually have some payloads that they are intending to, um, to deploy after the, their launch separation. So I'll cover that in a minute. But the Artemis one has a CubeSat program. So basically, there, I think they, it does, well, this says it does, and I believe they've actually only really, they're going, they're going to put 10, 10 CubeSats on the mission now. So I'll give you a little bit of an overview of those in a minute. Um, and it's something that's going to be in the um, the um, the interim cryogenic propulsion stage. They're actually going to be located in, inside that below the uh, service module, and they'll be deployed um, sometime after the um, separation of the service module and the Orion capsule from the um, ICPS after after the um, translunar injection.
it's a slide that's actually covering this. And you can see that the way that the payloads are spaced around there, it's they're they're far enough apart to try not to run into each other. And the, there's a there's a special ring that's adapter ring that's been developed in there to allow the set the CubeSats to be deployed from that. Yeah, also a couple of hitchhiker payloads, I believe they've only, and they're all the size of shoe boxes. Um, Thirty fourteen kilograms each. So they're not they're, they're six cube sets. So they actually are larger than um, I think that would be the largest size really you can get of six years. Uh, they will probably talk mention that later on whether I'm wrong about the six U capacity being the largest that you normally would get. But I think that's um, showing that. And you'll see there also the where they're located there in terms of the um, where they're going to be situated for deployment later on. Yeah, avionics unit, mounting brackets, cable harnesses, and a vibration mitigation system. So that's all designed to, to keep them safe while the, the, all the um, stresses of the launch will be occurring. But they've also got a weight limit too, as you can see, 14 kilograms. So they're, they're, they're going to be reasonable size CubeSats, but they're not um, um, they're not huge, huge payloads. There, but they've all got different purposes. Um, I'm just going through them now, there's a... D different um, different people have been putting up um, uh, proposals for what they'll be doing. So, you know, Moorhead State University, um, Arizona State University, um, Jax has got got a payload on there as well. Lockheed Martin's got one of their own payloads there. Um, those ones are basically studying the moon, and they've also got some other ones studying the sun, and then they've got some other other missions there which are not really relating to that directly they've got asteroid so that one must be actually going further out than the moon itself some of the, the lunar ones obviously would be designed to impact on the moon um, some of the other one the cubesats there um, would be designed to basically go into a solar orbit and you've got some other ones that are even going further out and there's even one just doing specific studies for this for the earth as well Plus, we've got BioSentinel and Argo Moon. Yeah, so the, a couple of those are just basically observations of, to do measurements. I've got a short video on covering the, the satellites now. NASA is advancing science and technology with the first flight of the Space Launch System, or SLS. Demonstrating the capability of the new rocket and the Orion spacecraft in deep space for future human exploration is the primary goal of the mission. As a bonus, SLS will send small satellites called CubeSats to deep space destinations where they can gather valuable data for future exploration missions. Once in orbit, the SLS upper stage, called the Interim Cryogenic Propulsion Stage, fires its engine to propel Orion toward the moon. SLS will send Orion farther out beyond the moon than the Apollo astronauts traveled, where it can test communication, navigation, and other deep space exploration systems. Once Orion is a safe distance away, the fleet of 13 CubeSats will be deployed. The onboard avionics box will command each dispenser to release the small satellites, sending each one on their way to deep space destinations such as the moon or an asteroid. Each has a mission that can provide NASA with new key knowledge and test new technologies. CubeSats flown on the mission will perform in-space experiments and demonstrations that will actively advance the capabilities needed to take humans farther into space than
than ever before. Yes, I'm aware it did mention 13 in the video, but there is actually only 10 finally going to be going up there. So it's possible that a couple of them that were originally awarded the contracts, they weren't they didn't have them ready. So they didn't put, put the room on the fly. But as you can see, the diversity of the locations that will be going to, they I think that was that was basically done deliberately by NASA when they looked at the the types of missions that they were going up there. They're going to study various various bodies in the solar system and they they took a a fairly good um, cross section of what the proposals would have come up for them. So just to give you an idea what Artemis missions and the first few are planned over the next few years, I've got a timeline that I've been able to work out from um, how it appears to how NASA would like it to play out in terms of the timings. Um, we don't know whether or not this will, these, these dates will obviously met for a little while yet, but um, looking at the where we were going to be up for Artemis 1, I'm proposing it looks like May 2022 will be a, a, um, a timing for that. Um, all going well after this goes up, that's going to be around about a 25 day duration mission. This is going to be un, unmanned. The manned mission that they'll be planning, which will be called Artemis 2, um, is probably not going to be happening until around about May 2024. That's basic, basically planned um, by NASA, so it appears. So it's looking like um, that's also partly due to the the construction schedules that they've got for the different components. Well, they are they actually have, have got um, parts of the third and fourth missions they're building at the moment, but they, they're also up to Artemis three capsules. But these all take time to build and check out. So based on the timelines currently at the moment, that that's going to be like a ten day four person lunar flyby. Um, so nominally that's determined to be around about 2024. The landing mission that the that NASA was looking at with the human landing system that they HLS concept that's been awarded last year, that'll be using a, a lunar starship as the lander. That's going to be happening in uh, 2025. The 2026 mission, which they've got down nominally for Artemis IV, um, will not actually be manned, or rather it will be manned, but it, instead of going to the moon, it's actually planned to have a um, deliver components uh, to the, the uh, new gateway that NASA is also building as well, which they'll be using like a, um, well, I suppose you can saw a, a small version of the ISS in size, but basically a, 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 an orbiting um, outpost that they'll be building in a, in a halo orbit around the moon it's longer term they will be needing basically for um for, for missions and long durations on the moon and artemis 5 would be planned for 2027 and that would be another manned mission currently the timelines though for certainly from three onwards are a bit questionable because um the, the recent reviews that have been done indicates that NASA has problems with certain components. Um, also, there's problems with the funding of the HLS itself and that Congress hasn't really allocated all the money for it yet that NASA is asking for. So that is going to push the day out. But the other major delay apparently for Artemis III is the, is the lunar spacesuits. While NASA has come up with a prototype for it, they haven't actually fully funded and uh, allocated a um, manufacturing schedule for it that indicates that it would be ready by the timeline of 2025. So we'll see whether or not Artemis 3 does actually occur in 2025, but um, there seems to be things that indicate it won't be ready by that date. But this is the, the schedule that NASA is currently working off and we'll see how this all goes over the, um, over the coming coming a year or so really, because um, some of the money that NASA needs is gonna to have to be allocated by Congress in the next, uh, SLS itself has been fully funded, but the problem is basically with the, the landing itself, that has not been fully funded by Congress yet. So that's where the, the problems are going to occur with this, this timetable we've currently got. 
So just to give you a bit more information on the Artemis II mission, that's definitely going to be the first manned mission at this stage. Um, not going to be any earlier than 2024. There's going to be a crew of four. And currently the indications are that it's going to be three NASA astronauts and one Canadian. Um, there's going to be similar things happening with the other missions as well in that because of the... Um, the way that the gateway is going to be constructed, that some of the partners involved in that program are going to be basically be getting, um, there'll be like a but, well, it's almost a bit like this, this current space station uh, arrangements where sometimes if you provide a um, component to the to NASA for, for free, essentially, they will give you a, an astronaut slot. Uh, the Canadians have already negotiated a slot on the 2025 mission. And I believe the ESA will probably have a slot in the in the landing mission, although maybe not to to land on the moon as such. But one of the crew in that mission will probably be from the ESA, and I believe JAXA will also be involved in future missions as well. Everybody's got going to be getting basically slots in these crews of four, some of the, from some of the other partners over the first four or five Artemis missions based on how this is going to pan out. Now, NASA made an announcement about uh, 18 months ago now on who the Artemis NASA astronauts have basically been. And that you've got, um, and we've got the, I think there's 24 that they've got mentioned. Um, this is on the first page. We've got a, some of them are actually flying or at the moment, I think Raja Chari is going up, or if he isn't on the. So there'll be the majority of these astronauts will have flown to the ISS by the time this, by the time um, Artemis II takes place. But they are trying to make sure the majority of these astronauts have got at least one mission under their belt. Some of these ones have actually been up to the ISS before. Certainly, Joe Acaba has been up there. Um, in fact, if he has, he might even be the mission commander at the moment, I believe. Um, Victor Glover's just been up there. Uh, Warren Hoberg, I believe, is going up there. Kajel Lindgren's actually been there. Certainly, Christina Cox has been there. Uh, I don't believe Johnny Kim has been. So you'll, you'll notice that certainly with some of the, the people that they've picked, a lot of them have been, have already had uh, experience with the ISS or they would be going up there on some of the other missions prior to that. So you'll, uh, and even in fact, Stephanie Wilson, who hasn't flown to the ISS recently was um, on a shuttle, several shuttle missions. So um, these will be the people that are most likely going to be in the landing crew, one of these, this group here. So we'll see how this goes in terms of the selections. Um, they did indicate, though, that definitely one of the astronauts going up on the landing mission will be a woman. So that gives you an idea. If we can start start looking through the list there of names who you might pick, um, this will probably be more clear in the, as time goes on. But they did indicate that that's going to be the case, certainly for the la first landing mission. So we don't quite know who that's going to be yet, but they have a lot of sort of very very qualified people on this. So that does indicate though, and I know that has been raised by some people that if Artemis is continuing on for, for five or six years, at least after that, that NASA is going to have to qualify more astronauts for Artemis and the ISS. There isn't actually a lot of astronauts there to, to um, cater for potential pre-rotation issues or people having to be replaced due to medical problems. So. Uh, this is only really the starting point, but um, I believe NASA knows that's the, tra the truth. But one thing to note is that currently they are recruiting more astronauts every year now. And they, for the last two years, basically, they've put on uh, training astronauts. So this list was going to grow here that you can see from what's been selected. quickly give you an overview of the Artemis II mission, how it's, it seems to have been painted at the moment. Um, it will be a shorter mission because it won't be going out quite as far out of the moon, but it's, it's basically going to be a lunar flyby nominated around about 10 days. 
So um, it's going to be quite similar in terms of the um, the, the, prof the profile with, with the same capsule, but obviously um, it will be carrying a crew of four, but it's only, only intended to be a lunar fly flyby. And it's going to be on what well, they call a free return trajectory. So as I said, four days out and four days back, and it's going to be rather a large loop around the moon as well, but I don't believe they're going to put it in orbit, whereas the, um, the first mission was going to go in orbit. Now, the Ar Artemis three mission is targeted to, to land on the moon. Uh, it's going to be to the South Pole region. They really have not worked out the exact landing location at the moment. I mean, some people have speculated near Shackleton Crater. So and that's as much as we know at the moment. The Starship's been selected as the lander and there's going to be a crew of four astronauts, but two astronauts landing on the moon and two remaining in orbit. The orbit probably that, that, the, that they'll be picking though will be in the, obviously the Orion capsule and service module, but probably it will be docked to the, um, the lunar gateway that will be set up there. But the actual profile for the mission is still up for debate. So we are a, a little way away from that now. So I did have a profile for three I'd seen recently before they announced the, the, um, the recent um, winner last year, but I didn't see much point in actually showing you that because it's going to be probably changed based on the fact that we have a quietly different uh, landing vehicle to what originally a lot of people are expecting. And this is going to be like a six and a half day mission. So certainly comparing it to the Apollo missions, it's going to be twice as long. Um, and they're going to be taking down approximately 400 kilos of payload. Um, as you can see, 50 kilograms of tools, 150 kilograms of science surface experiments. And they'll, be, they'll also be taking down a rover as well. I believe though that the that the um, Lunar Starship has much larger capability than that. So whether or not that gets revised in terms of what their payloads are going to be, but it's certainly going to be able to take a lot, lot larger payloads than the 400 kilos because um, it's one of the reasons why NASA had selected it for some of the missions as well was its, its landing capabilities. But um, as you can see, originally it was 2024 they were planning, and NASA's already slipped the date to 2025, and I think it's going to slip again. But that's what we're looking at, basically, in terms of how long the mission will be going for around about six and a half days, which, compared to the Apollo missions, is about twice as long. Yeah, but they'll have actually a much, much larger vehicle and much roomier. Uh, yeah, the speculator then speculation will be is that it's going to be using the gateway orbit for as part of the dynamics thing. you can see that it's in quite a complicated halo orbit but this will be a nominally a, i think a 30-day mission i'll talk about the gateway in a few more minutes now so um the reason for picking the gateway itself was, is basically the architecture is, is um, cheaper in terms of delta phi once the gateway is established for basically landing on the moon regularly from, from, a, uh, from an orbit. So there has been some discussion about whether it would have been easier to do a different type of orbit around the moon to do this, but um, they basically worked out from a, from a basically a Delta V and uh, landing mass that they can do, it's it's actually better to use this particular type of orbit. Admittedly, with the height, the lunar starship, it's probably not necessary with this type of thing to do that use the gateway at all. In fact, I believe that they may not be using the gateway, but it's that's why I said it's still up for debate whether they'll be. Uh, but longer term, they are intending to use the gateway as as a as an outpost. So. Um, it's, it's, it's in quite this complicated orbit they'll be setting up for it. And um, they're already building the two major components initially that they'll be sending up there with the contracts already. So um, 
they should be ready, the actual components ready next year, or well, I don't believe they'll be launching until 2024. And um, there's basically a, a, um, a logistics module and another uh, communications module there with, with panels on them that they'll, they'll be sending up there. It's a propulsion, power propulsion model, US utilization module, as they call it. Some more details in a second about that. That's actually finally what they think the gateway is going to look like. Now, at one stage, there was speculation there would be Russian components. I don't believe that's going to happen anymore now, based on what's been happening in the last month or so. So this is the latest diagram that the um, ESA have been, was working on last year because the Russians were interested at one stage and then stopped being interested. But um, you'll see quite a lot of components have been supplied by ESA and JAXA, and um, that's and they'll be delivered in different stages. But um, the the habit, habitation and logistics modules, some of those will be going up fairly early, but um, the other ones will be coming in a peer, over a period of time. They'll be delivered with different launch vehicles, and we'll talk more about them in a minute. But this particular gate, gateway, as you mentioned earlier, will be on a very uh, rectilinear halo orbit. Okay, so the power and propulsion element is the first module that's been, that originally was planned for a 2022 launch, but uh, that's been deferred. Uh, I now believe it will be going up on a, a Falcon Heavy and they'll be sending that up with the other module that, um, that um, Northrop Grumman has developed basically. And this is, as I said, basically a power module with, with solar panels on it and a communications module as well. So the habitation module will be going up with the, um, with the other power propulsion element. And I believe that will be planned to use a Falcon Heavy launch vehicle. Yeah, around, around about 2023, as you can see, it won't, won't be ready any earlier than that, but um, it could be ready to, um, to, to go with Artemis, but they've then changed their minds on that. I understand that they're now going to be using Falcon Heavy to, to send those two up because they didn't really want to use an Artemis for that because in terms of the, the, the capacity of the... Uh, the Falcon Heavy, that's capable of launching those two together. But later on, they actually have to launch um, these other contracts were only awarded last year. That's the Talos Alenia Space Stability I have. That's the other habitation module. And that's going to be going up with the, um, um, the Esprit module as well. So that's going to be using Falcon Heavy for the communication phase. And then it's the refueling of Artemis 5. Yeah. So Esprit is going up over two different launch and the the other one is using Artemis 4. So as you can see, um, they're going to be using a few launches, additional launches as well for it to, to, to send the components of the gateway up. And I don't believe the gateway is going to be finished until around about 2028, 2029. But these contracts have now been awarded. So they've actually, uh, they'll be starting to build these two components later on this year, but they haven't started yet. I was reading the other day. so. You can see that um, there's definitely the gateway is going to be built and it's just a matter of when. And as you can see, the artworks come out for the, the lunar base concept. We are a little way away from that though. That's going to be the 2030s. The first few Artemis missions are only going to be really short durations. And as you can see there, they've got a pressurized driver there as well with the, with the crew and there's there's four astronauts on the surface, and that's what they will be able to do when they we get um, more capability with the the Orion the Orion capsule and crews going there. But the the initial landings will only have two two astronauts going down to the surface like they did back in the Apollo days. And that's the end of the talk, folks. I hope you enjoyed it, and I'm not going to take some questions. I'm just looking in the what we've got there, okay. Yeah, they certainly aren't in a hurry, yes, that's right. <laughs> well, Ken, you're right there, but 
I think the real problem is going to be um, that the funding has had a lot to do with it and also some of the some of the quality issues they've had is what's taking so long. Orion's actually been ready for probably eight years, the capsule has been. I believe they tested that in our Delta Heavy back down about 2013, 2014. It, it's actually been ready for a while, but um, building everything else has taken a long time. So that's that's one of the problems. Yes, yeah, so I've actually got a couple of videos after this. If you wanted to actually see the stacking of the Orion, I can show you that now, but I've got to stop sh stop this sharing and show the video. Uh, oh, you've got a question, Lou. Yeah, yeah, talk. You can I've talk. got a question, Wayne. Um, you showed the uh, the um, um, Starliner as being the, the, uh, the, the, the first landing vehicle for the... That's Starship. Starship. Starship, sorry. Yep. Yeah. Um, so how does... How, w w what's the launch vehicle? Is it... Is, that's its own launch vehicle too, isn't it? No, there's the super heavy. At the Starship's the, only the upper stage. Right. And super heavy booster is, is the big launch of it. So they've actually stacked the super heavy yes, at no Starship, no. Starship over at um, Boca Chica at the moment. I believe yep. they then took it down. But uh, the Starship, the total stack for the Starship is actually, it's bigger than the Saturn V. Right. Now, I think I was talking about this last month that the um, the capability of Starship is potentially greater than uh, SLS, but it's not there yet. And there's still a bit of a debate as to whether they're going to be using the um, uh, which version of Starship they're going to be using. There's going to be a special lunar variant. The the original Starship concept was supposed to go to Mars, yep. so there's there's going to be some potentially um, changes to the to the the um, the engines that SLS is going to be using. Um, sorry, not SLS um, Starship is going to be using. So they're not quite sure exactly where that's going in terms of when those engines are going to be ready. Um, I believe though that the way that the the bid had gone, they weren't even going to be using their stage two engines for this bid. So. Uh, the, the thing about the Starship is that it is capable of certainly going to the moon. Um, they would have to actually send it up there and it's going to be have to dock with the, um, the current um, Orion capsule once it gets there with the service module. And it's going to have to be sent over there as, in an unmanned cap capacity, right? So it'll, it'll rendezvous in the lunar orbit and then dock with that and then go down to the surface. But... So Yep. I mean, it, um, it seems to pretty uh, vertically it seemed quite a quite a, a big vehicle. Yes, and yes, you can see cruise on the top. Like... How do they get down to the surface? Well, um, let's just go back. I'll have to just stop stop the presentation for a second and I'll show you. There was a picture of that. Um, you're right. And that was one of the things that was raised about it. Uh, find on the screen. Okay. Right. Yeah. yeah. Okay. So you can see that now. Uh, in fact, it's almost got like a, you know, the guys that go up, the, the guys cleaning the windows and things like that. It's got like a, it's going to have to have like a rigging system where they can actually lower the lower the astronauts down. Yeah. 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 yeah there was there was questions raised about that, but one of one of the problems is that out of the three people bidding, three groups bidding for it, there was one where it was really easy to get out. The other one, which was the um, the Blue Origin bid, that was the America team, I think as they called it. It seemed to be a long way up too. That was around about forty or fifty feet. Mm. And this one is ridiculously high, as you suggested. Yeah. There. It's a huge vehicle. Yeah, and you can see now that for a vehicle that's that size, it's got much better cap payload capabilities than anything else that was going to go up there. Mm -hmm. I think the only problem really is that it really, even with the three bids, all three had vehicles had problems with being able to meet some of the criteria that NASA was concerned a bit about. So, uh, you know... Um, it's going to be interesting to see how this all pans out because that's partly why with the dates, um, Starship hasn't flown yet, as we know. 
Mm -hmm. um, there was going to be a special lunar starship configuration that they were developing. I mean, they were also developing another version of um, even the, the, the Dragon capsule that was going to be going up for missions to the ISS. So SpaceX has been working on several different profiles to supply the gateway configuration as well, apart from, and, but Starship is really only in, involved with the lunar landing. But the, mm. the interesting thing about this is, uh, Alan, is that they technically that they've only been awarded a contract for two missions, one and one manned and one unmanned. So mm. I don't quite understand what's going to be happening with Artemis V, who the, what the landing vehicle is going to be. They mm. think that the um, the other bit, the um, which one of the other bidders, not and not Blue Origin, potentially could get the the other bid, but um, NASA still put this up for, for for tender. So that's why talking about this is a bit interesting. Why the, the lunar orbiter? Uh, well, that's that's a fair question, but um, that's the profile that they've decided to adopt. I think that was partly because they just wanted to leave two in orbit, but I, I'm not sure. I suppose that was partly on the concept that they wanted to keep um, keep astronauts up there to, in case there was any problems. But the, it was they were going to be keeping an eye with the capsule, the Orion capsule, and the lander was always going to be separate. Um, yeah, I can see China. Well, yes, possibly can, but we don't know enough about the Chinese space program to make serious comments about that. It depends. Okay. The main Sorry. thing to note about the Chinese space program is that they haven't got the same constraints that the American space program has. The Chinese government can fund it as much as they want. Mm. And the, the, you aren't really going to have public opinion complaining about it. Mm. <laughs> uh, from chart from the I, I have some questions and so does Lou I can see is going to hand up as well but can can we can we stick our oars in you can but I'm looking at the questions coming up in the chat John if you're sticking your hand up I can't always see them so okay yep uh, okay well um a, a few things is that the solid rocket boosters they are not reused like in the space shuttle that's the impression I get from the graphic um, and I another agree. one is that, like, there, there were some at some retro, retrospective uh, analyses done on the Apollo mission, and just saying it was basically too unsafe by today's standards. And I wonder how the, the safety of their lunar missions will stack up there. And I suppose maybe you've talked about this in the past, but I'm wondering about the overall politics of how it came about and how the U.S. government actually managed to find uh, that the uh, the money to do it, because I suppose these general uh, heavy lift launch vehicles are perhaps a, a useful thing to have generally, and maybe they're competing with the Chinese. But, you know, I'm wondering, you know, how was it that this actually went from an idea to actually having some money from Congress going towards it? And who knows, maybe some of those questions are deeper than you can answer, but they're things I'm curious about. Thank you. We've got a lot of questions there, a lot, and some of them are partly politically based. Um, uh, well, originally, prior to the Trump administration, the plan was to go back to the moon, and that was in the Obama administration, of which the current president was vice president and also actually in charge of NASA. So I believe NASA has been planning on going back to the moon for a while, and they were planning on setting up a base. I think the issue was always when that was going to happen. The big problem has always been with SLS funding is how much money um, SLS gets. Now, SLS is a long way over budget and um, the Office of Inspector General inside NASA has made plenty of comments about the contractors getting paid money that they probably weren't being entitled to get. So that's in itself is a hot potato, but um, there is problems with the, the contractors um, taking far too much time and money to do that delivery. Um, the, cap, the Orion space capsule has been ready for a while. It's just the SLS is what's been taking so long. But as I said to you earlier, but part of the funding problem is that, um, that they have not fully funded the landing solution, even though they were well aware that they had to do it. And NASA has been asking for money, yet Congress hasn't given it to them. Now, I believe that some of this may have been resolved recently with some of the funding that's come back from NASA, but I, 
I haven't looked at the numbers seriously. So I think the problem is that they're trying to get interest in these things has been tricky with, with the public. And that's been a thing. I believe that what their plans are for the lunar missions longer term is going to be is that there's going to be some type of, um, uh, you could say, external companies involved. It's going to be private. There's going to be private companies of interest as well, or people helping helping the bids to, to keep the costs down, particularly if they're going to build a base. So whether or not everybody that's on, on the, the final moon base is fully NASA astronauts is, is something that will be we'll be waiting to see. Um, the SLS has been in planning for a long time. Um, they, you know, they only recently renamed it Artemis, I think th about three years ago, but it was originally called uh, Exploration Mission 1, I believe, but it wasn't a really particularly sexy name. And they came up with the, the recent one from uh, Artemis, which made a lot of sense in terms of being this being the sister program to Apollo and the, and the successor to it, which is that made a lot of sense that they did that. Uh, okay, so Lou, okay, so I'll, I'll do Alan's first, stability of the Starliner. All right, just hold on a second. I'm gonna to have to stop this sharing here because it's causing me some problems with seeing your questions. Oh, right. Okay. So yeah, you're right. Look, Alan, it's, it's going to be interesting with the, with the, with the Starship. Um, Starship has already had some test landings on the earth. Um, it's obviously going to have to do the same types of things as well. That's why yeah. there's going to be an unmanned mission, right? They're going to have to test it on the moon. Uh, there's a lot, a lot of things got to happen with that. And I'll, we're going to be hopefully do see some further things about Starship, but I've been loath to talk about Starship at the moment because um, there's so many things about Starship design which are being worked out now. It's a little bit different to NASA's projects because a lot of that stuff takes place inside a building, whereas um, everybody can see what Elon's doing down in Boca Chica, and in some ways he likes all the um, the people running their drones down there to to look at every everything that's going on every day in terms of what they're doing with it. But the problem is that a lot of it still is in the design phase. The difference between, I suppose, the contract that the SpaceX is currently going on there with is that a lot of it is trial and error with Starship and that they're trying out new things and materials, whereas um, the, the contract that's doing the, the SLS have been very loath to, to use to sacrifice any components, so to speak, whereas Musk is building like about 20 odd prototypes. If you look at the, um, the current prototypes that they're up to, I believe with the Starship currently, which is the top, top stage of it, that's up to SN25. So he's got 25 prototypes he's cur currently built prior to this current one that they've got there. That's pretty unheard of in terms of what they're doing with SLS. They just can't keep doing that. A lot of the uh, the design of the, some of the components has been done on computer modeling. So it's quite different to the mm -hmm. way. We will gateway. Oh, Liz got a question on the gateway, uh, wholly remote. Um, it's going to be largely remote, I understand, Lou. Um, there will be some missions where the, the components will be docked, but the first two that go up there certainly will be remotely sent up there. and. Um, it's probably going to be 50-50, but I believe it's going to be essentially remotely constructed. And it will have a Canada arm as well. That's partly why the Canadians have got, a, um, have got an astronaut um, going up there. Uh, I believe that there is a robot arm going to be attached to it. Uh, let's see. Has Eva put his question in the chat? Anne, or is he going to ask me directly? I can't see. Oh, okay. I, I was going to ask it directly if I can. That's good. That's, you can. You can. Okay. So th the question is um, how Australia's efforts are related to Artemis. 
because we know we have this Moon Mars initiative that our fearless leader uh, signed us up to with you know, about 150 million. It's going to be in the science lever and some of the, the prelim missions. That So we go back to where, how it fits in, uh, science goals. Okay, so there'll be components relating to, uh, hang on, oh, I've got to find the site. That's the lunar landing mission. The one I need to find is the ones. Okay, so this one. There's going to be polar landers and rovers and non-polar landers and rovers. So where Australia's components are going to be fitting in is going to be in the landers and rovers section. And I believe there was one of the bids was going to be for a rover, wasn't it? It is, yeah. It's called Trailblazer. Yeah, so and um, Lunar Trailblazer. Yeah, and so, we, yep. we put proposals in approximately one week ago. Uh, we being meaning that I'm just a junior person on uh, the Andrew Barton led one, but apparently there are two other proposals going in. Yeah, so where Australia fits in is going to be the. But was the lander that you were putting in, or the rover you're putting in, was that going to be a polar polar rover or just a general rover? The, apparently, there's rovers going up for that may not necessarily go to the the lunar poles, but they are setting up other rovers anyway to test some of the technology. So, do you know specifically what that where that no, rover? No, I don't. Nope. Yeah. No, nope. I was wondering if, if if you had any idea also about the timing. You know whether it's it looks here as though it might be twenty twenty four. Well, but... these missions were going to be going up potentially before the, the landing. So if you look at the timings, we are talking about in the next three years. So I understand that it would if they're going to get uh, a flight. They, had, they don't have a lot of time to build it. Mm, yes. So yeah. if you're looking at what's going to be going up there, that's correct. Um, I would think that the bid's gone in and then they'll be, but that's actually where it will fit in. It'll be fitting into the, the lunar science area that, that NASA said that they had to gain additional information prior to the actual landing. I mean, they haven't really sorted out the landing site, for example. So with these particular rovers, they'll be they'll be doing measurements on the lunar surface, and some of it which will be they'll be looking for water, because that's that's one of the major reasons for going to the South Pole, was they believe that there's lunar ice. So they would be sending landers down there and also rovers specifically looking for for volatile. That's what they said, polar volatiles, as in as in ice. So mm -hmm. they're trying to work out exactly where that's located and that's going to be where they're going to be putting a base base nearby so they can li literally harvest it or dig it up and, and, and use the water and the other regolith components for potentially a, a well, a, I suppose you could say a cover over a top of a base that they might build, but there has been people looking at being able to use the regolith in, in, in the building of some type of habitat. So uh, that that's so that that would be what the where, where it's going to fit in, Eva. I think. Um, yep. But as you said, if you're looking at how long in the future that's going to be, that's not too far in the future. So I would think that if this this is being that bid's going in at the moment, I would think that they're actually going to have to start building seriously by next year. Mm -hmm. There's not a lot yep. of time left. No, no, it's exciting, isn't it? Mm. <laughs> well, I think the big problem is with the timelines anyway, but as you can see, <clears throat> it's going to be happening pretty soon, real soon now, folks. So in itself, it was a coup that we've been able to get this. But we did sign the Artemis Accord. I think it was 12 countries that have signed the Accord. So all those countries that have signed the Artemis Accord that the the previous NASA administrator came up with, they would all have been agreeing to basically participate in this program. And we're one of the signatories, and there's a few other countries as well. I think New Zealand's also involved in it as well. I think they've got um, Rocket Labs going to be contributing somewhere along the lines. I I believe. Okay. So there's a few countries involved with it. 150. Yeah, so... That's where we're up to at the moment. I'm just trying to see. Yeah, where. no, that's helpful. Thank you. So, so sorry about the exact, but that's actually where it's designed to fit in. 
in, in that particular um, you know tranche of work. So I would think it's going to be real real soon now, as as some people say. Um, let's see if I've got any more questions. Yeah, moon surface is oh, yeah, some of the moon surface is soft. But yes, but a lot of it's not. not. Yeah. Not all of it's not though. So um okay, I unless anybody's gonna ask me directly, I think I've covered everything today. Um hopefully you've learned a bit more. But as I said, there's still going to be a few things um revealed to us in the next few days in terms of the, the coming mission and and certainly as you can see there's a few a few things are rubbery for the artemis 3 mission at this stage which we really won't know about for another 12 months but the, certainly with the way that nasa's pipeline is working the gateway is definitely going to be built under certain timelines but the concern at the moment is that they haven't got proper funding for the artemis 3 mission and that's going to blow out the timelines i was talking to you about earlier Okay, so um, 